Welcome everyone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this is going to be a lively, informative debate. At the end of the day, we have come here today to spend time, and I hope share knowledge with each other. I'm very curious to know what you make of what's going on in this country. We just heard from Hatim Shanfari that, you know, our man is facing challenging times. That's how I read it. Sure, there's money set aside, but how long will it last? Especially since this economy is very reliant on income from oil, is it not? So really the equation is that you're not getting much money in from oil these days. You need to keep spend up on infrastructure to keep the economy ticking over and to keep people in jobs. How is it going to balance out? Bearing in mind the value of projects awarded in this country during the first three months of this year were 43% lower than in the previous quarter. That's significant, isn't it? 43% lower. My question is, what projects are being pushed back? How is this situation being handled? Let me also share with you that exports dropped from 21.7 billion Armani Reals in 2013 to 20.46 last year. This again on the back of the plunge in the price of oil. So, what is life like with the price of oil at 50 or $60 a barrel? Well, please welcome to the stage the Chief Executive of Vision Investment Services, Ali Mohammed Jama. The Technical Director of PDO, Amran Al Mahrubi. The Head of Corporate Affairs at Shell Development Oman, Irshad Al Lawati. The Director of Kimji Ramdas, Pankash Kimji. And the Acting CEO of Bank Sohar, Rashad Al Musafir. And last but not least, the CEO of Port of Dukum Company, Reggie Vermeulen. Now, as you just heard from the uh, moderator earlier on, Please, if you have a question, do raise your hand. There are microphones on the floor. I will be asking you some questions throughout this morning. But if you have a burning issue, raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. At the end of the day, we have certain things that we think are interesting. But really, it is about what you want to learn and discuss too. So don't be shy. If you actually have a question to start off with, feel free to raise your hand. Gentlemen, good morning. Can I ask you to move up one chair, just so that you're all nicely clustered together? And let me very quickly ask each of you a question. Rashad, is there concern over the community here, you know, business going out of business about payments being kept up and so on? And as, let me just qualify, you know, I ask this specifically because I'm curious to know, are there delays in payments that will affect how companies deal with banks and how you will have to deal with them in turn? Um, I think, I think the, the straightforward answer is um, there, there necessarily has to be some kind of uh, government rationalization in spending, just as you said. Um, we, um, your statistics has uh, shown that the government spending has, uh, in, into infrastructure has reduced, and it is well known that the Omani economy is heavily dependent on government spending. So um, over the past uh, period, um, the uh, element of caution from uh, government spending and the element of caution, even from private sector uh, spending, is being witnessed. And we do see that there is... But I suppose uh, what I'm asking, though, is are you concerned? In other words, are you now becoming more cautious? Are you saying to companies, oh, you know, I'm not going to lend you any money, actually, right now? You know, what's going on? How have you changed your behavior? Our level of cautionism is higher than pa in, the, in the past, yes. Uh, most organizations, most banks, we have, we have to balance between the interest of shareholders, the interest of depositors, and the interest of customers. And in such uh, circumstances and situations, yes, there has to be a, an escalated level of cautionism from banks. So allow me to ask the audience, you have your voting systems, right? Are the banks less friendly these days? Yes for no, yes, for, uh, yes is what is it, one or something? I don't know. Yes is one and no is two, please. Are the banks less friendly? Can we see results anywhere? Mm. 
So does that mean that everybody's voting yes? Is that what it says? Basically, there's an overwhelming... <laughs> So the reason I'm asking is because, right, okay, so ah, in fact, no, so the banks are still being friendly. 52% of you, I wonder who you are, are saying that the banks are still being very friendly. Fine. But my big question is, when times get tough, what usually happens is that the source of money maybe doesn't dry up, but starts trickling, right? There are delays in payments and so on. I'm sure I'm going to come to you with the Kimji Group. How is it going for you on your side of the coin? But what are you going to do to help the business community if this happens? If companies are not being paid on time, what are you going to do about it? Me. No, you, the banks. First the banks. First the banks. Please. OK. Um, see, um, definitely um, it is the role of the banking institutions to continue to keep liquidity into the market. Um, but that has to be done with a level of uh, caution, with a level of uh, security for protection of customer depositors' rights, because at the end of the day, this is depositors' money, and you don't want to uh, throw it in areas where you may lose it. So yes, there is an element of uh, um, risk averseness, but we are uh, becoming more flexible. The banking sector in general is becoming a little bit more flexible on um, whether you call it rescheduling or you call it uh, uh, realigning different cash flows for customers itself. So we do expect customers to come back and say, listen, we have uh, issues, we have delays in payments either from government, and uh, we, do, uh, we do look at that um, from a, uh, a partnership perspective. Okay. I'll be honest and say that was a very beautifully crafted answer, but it still doesn't tell us, are you going to be helping businesses if they're going through difficult times? when you know that actually money is tight. I'll leave that hanging. <laughs> Pankaj, I'll come to you in just a minute, but first, Amran, I want to ask you. You know, the, my understanding is that the break-even point in this country is around $100 a barrel. That's quite high. So how, how are you going to manage keeping spend up if oil prices stay low for a very prolonged period? Well, firstly, thankfully, I don't have to. It's not where, it's not where I am. Uh, what, Sorry, I meant in general, the government, in general, the country in general, I know, but I, I can only, I have to answer from my yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. um, our most important thing is, do we have projects that meet the $50 or $60 scenario? Now, fortunately, uh, the 2015 program, and we're just now completing the 2016 program. Uh, we've looked at the projects and their screening, and there isn't a single project in that program that wouldn't stand a test at $50. We don't test there. So we have plenty of, plenty of things to do. Plenty of uh, our portfolio is healthy. We have demonstrated that um, our projects return money very quickly. So in terms of what well, I think the country should do, the last place to look for reduction in spend is towards the industry, whether it be at PDO or be it uh, the other companies. Say that again, sorry. The last place you look The last place to look for reductions in spend, and I want to say, I want to qualify that in a second, is at a company like PDO. We will generate money. We have projects that are very healthy at $40 a barrel, uh, and we will create money. Cutting back projects that are oil generating or, uh, is not the way forward. Where we have got work to do is not so much on cutting projects, but the, the area that we're really looking at at the moment is cutting waste. Because we do recognize that in, in our company, certainly, and I believe in all the companies represented here, there is incredible waste, which at $100 a barrel, perhaps, we're being a bit too blind to. And uh, this is now the opportunity to really tackle and deal with it in a positive way, not by cutting, but by improving. Okay. Let me go to infrastructure and ports. You know, this country has been blessed with a beautiful coastline. You are perfectly positioned to take a big chunk of the port business in the region. It hasn't quite taken off in the way that it was planned. 
We've been visiting here for years, we keep on hearing about great plans, but it hasn't happened yet. So my question to you is, it didn't happen when oil prices were high. Is it going to happen? Is it possible that it'll happen when oil prices are low? Well, because I say this because you need money and you need dedicated budgets and so on. Um, I think the short answer is yes, I think it will happen. Now when we see uh, there's no direct correlation with the fact that it did not happen at the speed some were expecting and the uh, oil uh, price uh, going low. Uh, on the one side, this, what is happening because we're referring to Dukum, is a true mega project. People sometimes tend to forget but uh, less than seven years ago, Dukum was a village of 70 people, the beach and nothing else, not even roads. Today, we are seven years later. Okay, we are not in full function, but we do have an international airport, which is open with a four kilometer runway. We have a port that is starting to, um, to, to operate and, and receiving cargo, and we are uh, working very closely to the oil and gas industry to lower the price of, uh, of getting goods and the project in Oman. So we are starting to play a role um, to a certain type of business and to the area of the, the country. It's for sure we don't have a role today on the B2C. The, the average consumer don't see the impact of Dukum and, and, and the realization, but companies like PDO, like BP, like Shell see already the, uh, the impact. On the, other, on the other hand, you're talking about the uh, lower um, income coming from the uh, oil and gas. I think that the important part of a project like Dukum is that we are, f we are looking for the long term. If you see the size of the land allocated to Dukum, it's larger than Singapore, it's larger than Hong Kong, it's even larger than Luxembourg. So we're talking about massive areas of land and the planification that we have is not on 20, 30, but it's on 50, 100 years. So we are looking for the very uh, long term. So therefore, the signal that we are receiving from the, the government today is that these type of projects like the railway, like other key projects, shall not be affected of the oil, and pr oil price because over the time of this project, oil will go down again and will go up again because, as I said, we're not talking on a 10 years base, but on 2030. So um, the signals we are having today is, okay, we have to be cautious. Do we really need certain type of infrastructure today or can we wait another five, six years? That's something that we're less thinking of a few years ago or even some months ago. But are we cutting drastically in price? No. So I think that, will Dukum continue? Yes, I'm confident. Can it go faster? It can always go faster. So at the end of the day, you are not concerned about money not coming your way. The promised allocated budget's not being trimmed, but it's all coming to you. And I ask because you've got the promises of around 2.5 billion Armani Rials to be pumped into the water infrastructure systems in this country over the next 25 years. You do have a dip in income. You know, again, it's a, it, there is a bottleneck that's going to happen at some point. So what I'm curious to find out is where are the, what projects are going to be held back or stopped? You're saying your business is definitely not one of them. All business would be to some extent uh, uh, in, impacted. The, the size of the, the impact will be maybe different between one budget or one uh, uh, project to another. Um, but I think one exercise that the country will go through, which is the, the, the most uh, interesting, is how to um, uh, transfer to some extent the burden, if I may say, of the development of the country from a state-driven economy to a private-driven economy. And I think that a, a time like now is crucial, and I think a lot of uh, discussion, and Pankaj can, uh, can, can comment on that, a lot of discussion is going on more intensely than before between the government and the, uh, the private sector to see how we can transfer a part, part of this development with, uh, I don't know, putting more and more PPPs on, uh, on the market, um, uh, build operate transfer, rely more on that rather than 100% government own, 100% uh, um, uh, government finance. If you look at Europe, for example, it's very imaginative in finding capitals to develop the same type of infrastructure because we do need in Europe uh, um, airports, uh, roads, uh, and, and utility network. So I think that uh, this is a transition that the country will have to go through. And I think the excuse or the, the, the situation of the $50 barrel is a, a nice triggering to start that sooner than later. And in parallel with that, you could, of course, have what the IMF has been suggesting. So, Pankaj, I want to ask you, 
tax or the idea of tax, what would that do to a business like yours? Is this the way the country should head? Um, tax into the, to the private sector or the corporate world, um, whether it's in a form of VAT or import, increasing of import duties or uh, levying service taxes from the various uh, statutory organizations, I think we will be receptive to it more today than ever before, considering the shortfall in the economy, provided we see a betterment of services coming in for the same increase in, in, in taxes. When you say services, what do you mean by that? I mean um, better decision making, more uh, leverage and, and power to the private sector, so, sorry, again, do you mean that you want to be involved in the decision-making process earlier on? Or, again, what does that mean? Better no, I want the government to uh, let the private sector take control of their destiny more than having to regulate the private sector the way they do at the moment. I do not want a PACP, a Public Authority for Consumer Protection, to tell me what prices I should sell a perfumery at uh, or the car standing there at. I want to sell at the price that I think the market deserves the price to be sold at. So you want to get on with business. Sorry? So you want to get on with business. You want to be left to get on with what you do best. Yes, I want to get on with business with least amount of interference mm -hmm. and least amount of dictator, uh, dictatorial um, uh, regulations on, on how I do my business. Now, this is, it, it, I suppose, great to say, it's very much needed, but how do you do it? You know, this is a big problem. At the end of the day, I, I will be very honest and say, wherever I go in the GCC, this, there are certain issues that keep coming up, one of which is the principle of no compete, for example, where governments shouldn't compete with the private sector. The issue of ease of business, it's a theme throughout, and so on. But we keep talking about these things, how to make it happen. Do you have one great idea? What is it? I'll take up your first question, which was saying, levy service charges and free up the economy. If I want to bring in skilled manpower, and if there isn't one available here, after going through a process of testing and hiring, then levy a service charge and let me hire as many people as I want, as long as I grow my business and pay my taxes. Irshad. How do we do the balancing act between bringing in the experts, transferring knowledge, creating jobs for the locals, and so on? And I refer to this morning's cartoon in, um, let's see where this is, in the Observer. I don't, you won't be able to see this, I'm sure. Can you, perhaps? I mean, it's just a very simple thing. There's a, a person thinking, yes, I'd like that job. Thank you very much. How do I get it? What do I need to make it happen? But again, this is an old conversation. So what's going on? Thank you, Anima. I think there is a learning process in everything. <clears throat> we have gone through a journey of four and a half decades, and we have gone, probably started it with a mindset of government does it all. And that has been the mode for quite a long time. Probably government was also doing business. There are still a large part of the private sector is uh, semi or fully government owned as well. So in that context, I think the private sector has been evolving in kind of a challenge position. Hit the borderline to then seek some extension or tweaking in order to be able to continue to do business. Very early on, actually, in the 80s, probably we started with the challenge of realizing that there is an act needed by the government to then create space and room for local workers. After all, in every nation, the nationals have to have the first privilege, have to have, uh, have, to have an advantage in the opportunities created there. But, I, I mean, nobody's denying that. And, in fact, the IMF would applaud no, any I'm effort. No, I'm coming, actually, to your question. So it, it's, it's a question of what jobs. Now, this process is important to bear in mind, is that it, it's been kind of a journey. Can I interject? I apologize. It's, for me, though, it's not just a process of what jobs. It's also how do you... Uh, 
what regulations are brought in to help make things happen where you're not, not sort of shooting yourself in the foot, as it were. So incentives, for example, the minimum wage being raised, what does that do to the job mix? We were talking earlier on about the change in regulation over ownership of um, the small family sort of corner shop situation. But then when the minimum wage went up, people stopped wanting to work in the corner shops because they could get more money doing something else. So how, how is this country going to manage doing what you're saying with bringing in the right sort of regulation to make it happen quickly? Well, I, I must paint, uh, paint a background to then show you the picture okay. from my perspective. And in that context, what I was trying to say is that uh, there is a little bit of uh, issue we are dealing with. Uh, for example, we talk about uh, SME sector, small and medium enterprise sector. Generally, globally, the average is some, uh, somewhat 60% of the uh, workforce is placed there. If you look at the workforce in SME sector in Oman, is 1.3% as per the latest uh, statistic announced. I'm trying to sort of bring up the challenge to then be able to put the rightly suggested answer there. And I think that the challenge is, I, I would probably a little bit differ with Pankaj in the context of leaving it completely to the private sector. I think there's always a duality of roles. There's a government role and there's a private sector role. You've got to, private sector is not charity. You've got to allow the private sector to develop itself and then fit in within the regimen defined and make the most of it and at times probably cross the borders a little bit then to be pushed back. Now coming to the creation of jobs for Omanis, and I think that's the first priority, creation of jobs for Omanis, I also buy into the argument that it's, it's not such a huge problem like we always have uh, sort of presented it. The statistic goes at up to probably 135, 145,000 job seekers are registered with the authorities, out of which probably 30 or 35,000 are real job seekers trying to get a job. Either they don't have a job or they really seriously want a job. Now with uh, up to probably 2 million expat population in Oman, 35,000 is not a big thing. But then the question is, I shouldn't be asking for Omanization of 90% in general. I should be more selective. I shouldn't lock up the talent into jobs like drivers, you know? When we have only that many Omanis looking for jobs, seeking jobs, we've got to identify, we've got to be selective in prioritizing what are the jobs for Omanis. And in that context, I think I like very much the challenge that was put by the uh, Majlis Shura just uh, recently before the uh, uh, manpower authorities, is that why don't you pick the top five ranks in private organizations and focus on Omanizing? That doesn't mean that push the talent in to then compromise the standing of the private sector entity. But then to drive, I think I, I like the initiative of developing CEOs that started recently as well. And this is where the value comes in, that we've got to be selective. Only that many Omanis compared to what the Oman, Omani economy can absorb in workforces. But allow me to speak as an outside observer. I see a pattern, which is, yes, there are few in numbers, in terms of pure numbers. However, it seems to me that the um, aspiration is always to be a leader or a C-suite operator, the top management. It surely cannot work like that, though, because people need to work. You know, it's about transferring knowledge, know-how, vocational skills, and so on. So allow me to perhaps differ with you, which is I, f I, I strongly believe that the focus on this top management uh, directive isn't always in the best interest of your target, which is empowering people to have the skills and ability to have a job. You, you give me an opportunity actually to touch on a very, very important point in that uh, aspect. When, when you talk about uh, that kind of a number of 35,000 real job seekers who, who, who are not employed presently, as opposed to the opportunities, I, I wouldn't seek actually to go right to the bottom. See, th there is always a curve of developing competence, whether it's top leadership or technical uh, leadership or technical jobs. And I think we, we should focus on education. One of the pro real problems we have in the country is education. And at times, it appears that that role of educating the nation is delegated to the private sector. In my view, there's got to be a better control. Again, private sector is commercial. Make the most of the opportunity. That doesn't always deliver the highest possible quality. 
you look at some of the most advanced countries and you would see that there is a focus on government owning that aspect. Germany is a good example in that regard, where I've studied. This is why I can use that example readily. But in, in that context, so coming back to the issue, I think we, we've got to then be focused in terms of what do we want. We've got to have a vision for the country, for the nation, for Omanis, and how we want to drive their future. Otherwise, the interest gets diluted. You know, if you sack 35,000 expat workers at the laborers' level and put in the 35,000 uh, Omanis, it probably is very easy. Probably the economy can sustain also that as a subsidy, private sector subsidy to the nation. A lot of companies put in large sums of money in corporate social responsibility. That could be another such but is that what we are seeking as a nation? Is that what we are seeking as a, as a country in Oman? We've got much better chances to then focus high. So I'm, I'm probably not critical to the challenge that we shouldn't immediately sort of plant CEOs in private sector. Pick a company and say, here's a CEO just graduated from this uh, training round. I don't mean that, and I think that's not how things work. But then the focus should be right. We shouldn't lock in our talent in driver's jobs. This is where we humanize 100%. What's the benefit that's achieving? Okay. Is, is there no better paying jobs and career in the private sector than that? But as you said, I mean, this is about setting the vision for the country and setting it on a path. This will take time. I'd like to know about the here and now from you, Ali, which is sentiment. Stock markets. Last week, it was pretty much zero, wasn't it? Dead. What's going on? Okay. Bismillah Thank you very much. Uh, since the question is about the stock markets, I think we have not reached to a level where the government or the public are seeing or, or appreciating the role the stock markets or capital markets can play in achieving the economic objectives. Today, we are talking about uh, diversification. The main theme is diversification. How can capital markets play a big role in achieving diversification? This is a very important issue. I have been arguing for the last maybe 15 years in every place I have the opportunity to participate that we need the government put a proper conference, a proper uh, think tank to explore how the other economies are using capital markets to achieving this objective. Therefore, the sentiment in Oman about the stock markets is, is, is not important to, from, from my perspective as an uh, investment uh, person, it's not very important because we, if you analyze the stock market MSM participants, you will see that mainly are pension funds and the strategic investors, and this is reflected in their daily trading volume. Uh, Post-financial crisis, before the financial crisis 2008, there was more participation from the retailers, business offices, family offices in the stock market. After that, uh, it, it, is, it, it died. So the stock market is not any news in the economy uh, and what is happening at 50.